Hey everyone, I'm pretty excited to talk about this video because we are going to be talking about what non-targets should do and which firms that they should apply to if they're trying to break into investment banking. The truth of the matter is that it's just a lot harder to break into these industries if you don't have that kind of pedigree that employers are looking for. And if you are a non-target, then you need to kind of employ a more gritty attitude. You need to understand that things won't come easily to you and there's a certain amount of extra effort that you need to put in. It doesn't make sense to dwell on how other people might have it easier than you. You just need to make sure that you do everything in your control to break in. So here's the data of the main target schools. If you wanna check this out, you can go to the previous video, but I just wanna point out that a lot of the main targets will send between 20 and 50 candidates every single year to the top investment banking firms. And that puts the semi-targets into that five to 20 per year range. So what I personally would classify as a non-target is a school that sends under five people per year into these main top firms. When it's only five people a year, that generally means that there's not a lot of finance alumni at that program. Maybe a lot of people are focused on other industries or just not focused on breaking in. So you have to make a lot of the luck yourself. So our goal here today is to understand what firms you should reach out to, because frankly, a lot of the top firms are gonna be occupied by these targets. In order to do this, we use the same LinkedIn data set of 22,000 profiles that graduated between 2014 and 2019. We then only looked at people who worked in US and Canada, which is about 15,000 people. We then extracted out all of the people who would have counted as targets or semi-targets that have more than five people per year in investment banking. And we end up with about 6,000 analysts in US and Canada, which is honestly not that bad of a percentage. That means about 40% of everyone in investment banking comes from these kinds of firms. Now, some schools that are on the cusp that some years might place like a semi-target include schools like Miami, Bentley, Michigan State University. These are overall relatively large, good schools that occasionally place, but sometimes don't have the consistent traction. Now, I will say it's a much harder path as a non-target. You have to put in maybe two or three times the amount of effort as your normal target peers. I think also you have to be mentally prepared to go to less traditional firms. So that could be going into financial advisory at an accounting firm or maybe a very small boutique. So what does the data say? If you strip out the bulge brackets and the elite boutiques, here are the firms that hire the most from these non-target schools. And if you go down this list, you can understand the underlying trends and understand better the firms you should reach out to. It's probably pretty obvious, but the next category of firms is going to be kind of these middle market investment banks that are on their way up into the elite boutique ranks because these are still the firms that hire the most amount of people. And a lot of the times I would say these are really good firms to look at because they need to compete with the higher rank of people, but a lot of times they can't get the talent from those target schools. Firms like SunTrust, RBC, Piper Jaffray, they're all good firms that are going to close investment banking deals, but they might work at the middle market. So when these top investment banks have attrition, they're gonna first reach out to people with a very similar experience. There was a lot of attrition in my group at Evercore and we first looked at these firms to hire people. I can tell you from a bulge bracket or elite boutique perspective, it can be sometimes difficult getting a lateral from another bulge bracket because sometimes the trade-off is not totally clear. So the most eligible candidates a lot of the times are people in this mid-market level. The second category I would say are foreign banks trying to break into the US. That could be BNP, Paribas, Mizuho, Canaccord Genuity, TD. These are firms that also have big investment banking operations, but are not as established in the US, so they might not have the brand recognition. And one great advantage of this is that a lot of their team will have come from abroad. They'll have lateraled from other offices around the world, and sometimes they don't understand kind of like the prestige rankings as clearly. So they'll be more interested in hearing from non-targets as long as they're capable people. For example, at a lot of the French banks, you're gonna have people that came from Europe that don't understand why one school is better than the other. And really they just want capable people who are interested in working at their firm. The third category I would say are regional or industry focused players that maybe are just run by one or two partners that are trying to stay in their lane. These are firms that can be very successful, but sometimes don't have the branding or the overall cachet to attract the top level talent. I've seen tech focused places like Union Square Advisors, financial technology partners that do great deals that are willing to hire from sometimes less prestigious schools. 
And the fourth category I would say, potentially the most underrated place to start your career are at the accounting firms with financial advisory business units. I've seen so many people on the M&A team or the deals and transactions department at the big four. And a lot of the times I've seen them move into investment banking or even directly onto the buy side. And despite getting paid a lot less, they actually do pretty similar work to normal investment bankers. So the list will go on and on, but really what you're looking for is firms that still do investment banking deals, firms that still engage in advisory and consult companies on financial decisions. You also want firms that have a track record of people lateraling into different groups. I can tell you, for example, at Evercore, there was an internal advisory group that helped support the operations for other investment banking teams. It was kind of like a middle office team. And you always got to move to an actual investment banking team after doing a year in this group. And if you understand those kinds of fast tracks, those pipelines, it's okay if you don't break in exactly to investment banking right away. And I would say the last criteria to keep an eye out for is that the firm should hire multiple analysts per year. I would say they should hire at least five because if they only hire one or two, it can be a bad expected value for you to spend so much time networking with them. And they might not take a chance on someone from a non-target path. All things considered, and I think the main purpose of this video is even if you can't get traction with the top firms, that shouldn't deter you from trying to break in. A lot of people, and I mean truly a lot of people, only break in after an additional year or two of working and grinding and moving up the ladder at different firms. So don't give up, continue to put in the effort, and over time, you'll definitely break in. So if you're in on target, let me know what's worked for you, what strategies have really helped you get your foot in the door and break into finance. If you're interested in learning more about finance or private equity, you can check out our dedicated recruiting course online. We also have a bunch of helpful blog posts that further articulate this information as well as other salient recruiting advice. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please remember to subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one.